Did you miss anything if you didn't watch it? No, you didn't miss anything at all. to the miscellaneous channel where we do miscellaneous things. I'm Zeleni. I typically cover TV, pop culture, internet trends, and other miscellaneous things on this channel, so subscribe if that's your vibe. It's Valentine's Day season, meaning it is love is blind season, meaning I have to come out of hibernation and recap some new love is blind content for y'all. Super Bowl who? We don't know her. I just did a video recapping love is blind Brazil, their season two. I did love is blind Brazil because I was like, oh, there hasn't been love is blind content in a minute, and I don't think there there is any coming up but I was completely wrong usually after the altar drops a little later I thought it was a little soon for an after the altar for season three I think they learned their lesson from season two where the after the altar came out so late that they missed some key updates particularly that the two married couples from that season got divorced the after the altar probably came too late for season two and they were trying to get ahead of it in season three, which I think was a smart move. So sorry for having so much Love is Blind content so close together, but I know y'all love Love is Blind. I feel like that's why a lot of y'all are here. So I don't foresee y'all complaining too much. So let me give you my general thoughts on the season three after the altar. Basically, did you miss anything? If you didn't watch it, no, you didn't miss anything at all. As usual with these after the altar specials, like nothing interesting happened. <laughs> it's always so hard for me with these because it clearly feels like the contestants are now, you know, employees of Netflix on the Netflix payroll and they're just there to put on a show. At least when they first come in, you can sort of suspend disbelief and believe that some of these people on the cast are trying to find love. In these after the altar things, it does feel a little more produced, like everyone has this arc they have to do. I still think the season one after the altar has been the most eventful and interesting. And the season two one was just such a train wreck. I have a video on that too. I think they went overboard with the overproducing and the fakeness just because the season two cast is so bad. And it's no shade to like the human beings that are behind the personas we saw of the people of season two. It's just like that cast was really bad at making reality television. And the season two after the altar is the worst one for me. Season three falls somewhere in the middle because I do like this cast better. It did feel a little more stripped down and less big producer shenanigans were going on. I feel like they just had one simple plot or arc for each couple for this round. The relief I had when I saw the episode lengths were 40 minutes and then like 30 minutes and 30 minutes. I liked that. I liked that there were shorter episodes. Honestly, the internet moves so fast on this type of news. It's really hard for the production of the show to keep up and give updates that are meaningful to the audience because the audience and the internet is already so many steps ahead. In this season's case, like we as the audience know that SK cheated on Raven before we even start the first episode. And for the entirety of the three episodes, we see SK still playing this part of devoted boyfriend and like thinking about marrying Raven and wanting kids with her. So already the SK and Raven plotline is completely outdated. Luckily they did provide an update and I'll talk about that when I get into the recap. After the altar, we'll just never beat the internet with updates on the cast. And from what I saw on Reddit and online, apparently this After the Altar was filmed in August of 2022 before any episodes came out. So that means like fan reactions and fan input didn't play a part. So let me just get into the cast recap and I'm gonna go by couples again even though a lot of them aren't couples anymore. And I'm going in the same order I've gone for all my Love is Blind season 3 videos starting with Nancy and Bartiz and their arc is that they are trying out a platonic friendship, but it ultimately fails. I don't think there's that much to Bartiz and Nancy. They weren't main characters the way they were in the regular season. And I do feel like this arc is heavily produced because they couldn't think of what to do <laughs> with them. We see Nancy and Bartiz go get lunch and they seem really friendly. As usual, Nancy is a great communicator. I've said it before, I admire her just direct and like friendly communication. It's, it's just so good. Because I think of her communication skills, I feel like they are getting along well at that lunch. Like they seem to have moved on from everything. She does defend 
her family's reaction, which was very intense at the wedding. And I appreciated that she defended them. At first, when I reviewed that, I wasn't sure if the family was overstepping and like making her uncomfortable. But she admits now with a year of hindsight that her family was saying the things she would have wanted to say. There was clearly a lot of love there from the family so I totally understand their reaction. And I just felt like in this lunch, like Nancy keeps saying like she wants to be friends with him but she's just giving Bartise so much credit for being so positive and so nice and I'm like, girl, this is, man is trash. Like the only reason he's being nice and positive is a reflection of you, you being so nice and positive and like knowing how to steer the conversation right. We see the girls hang out and there Nancy talks about how there was one time when her friendship with Bartise got a little blurry because she was like sitting on his lap and it just got a little flirty. Zeneb specifically tells Nancy like, maybe it's not the best idea and just just do my method of just not being friends at all which i i agree with zainab one of the few times maybe i'll <laughs> you'll hear me say that but being friends with an ex successfully where both parties are really healthy about it i feel like it's really really rare but it's to each their own definitely so the big moment for Nancy is her confessing to her family that she's been trying to be friends with Bartise. And her family is so funny about this. As usual, they hate Bartise. Her mom calls him the poop emoji. <laughs> Honestly, her mom should go on Reddit. She will find a lot of like-minded individuals there, a lot of solidarity. And her family straight up tells her like, I don't think it's a good idea for you to be friends with him. I mean, obviously they hate him. And the brother is actually more level-headed about it. He doesn't seem to hate Bartise as much. He's just like, I don't think this is a good idea because what are you getting out of this friendship, Nancy? Like, is he really adding value to your life? Again, it all feels kind of very produced. Like, they just didn't know what conflict to give Nancy and Bartise and this was the best they came up with. There's not much to work with with that couple, I think. Also, the very weird thing about all this is that Bartise, at this point, has filmed Perfect Match, which is the new, like, trashy Netflix dating show All Stars where he presumably is there to find love. So it just adds to this layer of fakeness because they don't mention the perfect match show on After the Altar at all. I don't know, it's just weird to get updates on everyone's love life and Bartise doesn't mention going on a, another dating show. The big event of After the Altar, because every After the Altar has to have a big event, is Alexa's birthday party. It is there where Nancy breaks up with Bartise as a friend and says, I don't think we should be friends anymore. And Bartise is confused because their friendship had been going well. This interaction showed why he is trash and n definitely not worth Nancy pursuing a friendship with because Nancy asks him directly, what do I get out of being friends with you, what benefit do I get? And Bartiz is like, that is a fucked up question to ask. Why do you need to get a benefit out of this? Excuse me? That is how friendships work. You both get some sort of value to your life from it. <laughs> just the audacity of him thinking Nancy should get anything out of a friendship with him just showed me like, okay, yeah, this guy's still trash one year later. But good for Nancy. I mean, I think this is the best scenario and he's not worth her time. He's busy being a Netflix employee on multiple dating shows, so he's busy doing his own thing. So next let's move on to Zeneb and Cole. They are the toxic ones of the group, the ones with the most drama. And their arc for After the Altar was that they haven't spoken or seen each other since the wedding and they're both nervous and stressed in their own ways about having to see each other at Alexa's birthday party. Zenob and Kamal are so toxic. I hate even talking about them because I'm just over them at this point. Like, I don't care. She is pretty delusional, still seems insecure and she keeps posting things on social media like not letting go of the cole stuff and the drama and cole he came off less villainous after the reunion he was sort of redeemed by this cutie story scene they showed it doesn't seem like he had malicious intents but in this after the altar special 
there were these little moments where I still saw him being a bit shallow. So I just don't like him that much. Not that I care that much about anyone in this cast. Like, I don't think I could hate anyone, like, in a serious manner. I've said it before. For Zenab, her updates are that she is very single at the girls' hangout. She says there's a new man in her life named Paul, but it's her therapist. <laughs> um, and that's good. I'm glad she's going to therapy. I mean, she did seem to have a lot of intense trauma from losing her parents at such an early age. Um, so it makes sense for her to be in therapy. I still see these moments of insecurity come out. When she's getting ready for Alexa's birthday party, she's like, I have to wear a sexy dress because I have, I'm gonna see Cole. This couple, both of them, feel very middle school to me. We see Cole talk to his friends. It was like an Australian girl there. And he says he is dating and talking to people. Seems normal. He wants to move to San Diego to be adventurous and find a beach babe in a bikini to marry. These are like the little superficial comments of his. And this conversation is a little important because we see his side of the story and what his stance is on everything that happened with Zenob. He says that she totally played him, that he thought she was gonna say yes at the altar, or that they were gonna just keep dating afterwards. In this conversation is where he references the cutie story and he again defends his side that he did not mean to police her eating the cuties, that he believes cuties are probably healthy, which I believe him in that, like, cuties are a weird thing to police someone eating <laughs> um, if you're worried about weight. And based on the scene we saw, it didn't seem malicious. He also says outwardly that he's stressed to see her. At Alexa's birthday party, that is the big confrontation moment. Cole is being really cringy to Alexa's stepmom, not believing that she is Alexa's mom because she is very beautiful. And it's probably fine to say once like, oh my God, you you look very young for being Alexa's stepmom or you look great or something. I mean, it could still read a little weird depending on how it's said, but he just kept saying it and saying it and saying it to the point where Bartiz just straight up took him out of the conversation. Cole's other kind of arc is that Brennan especially, and Alexa, but Brennan doesn't like Cole, and he didn't even want to invite him to Alexa's party, but he says they just want to invite everyone, meaning the producers are inviting everyone on the cast, because this is not a real birthday party. But yeah, it's funny how Bartiz is like, I wanted to get Cole and Brennan to sit down and talk to each other, and it's like, no you didn't, the producer did and told you to do it to get them together and put them over here. Brennan just really hates Cole and has pretty much fully believed Zainab's side of the story because Alexa is close with Zainab um, and just sees Cole as this big villain. A lot of people really hate Brennan for this. I don't care that much, honestly, like what beef these couples have with each other. It's just it's stupid middle school stuff. The actual important confrontation is Zenob and Cole and they finally talk and Cole is actually very like calm and level-headed during this conversation and I think that helps disarm Zenob a bit because she does soften. He just seems really tired of the beef and feud between them and I agree he doesn't seem like the type that can keep up with a beef well. And he also starts by apologizing for the eating stuff, even if he didn't mean it. He very directly apologizes, which I think was a good way to start and was part of what disarmed her. He does mention again that he thought they were gonna date afterwards and she stops him there and is like, did you really? Because you didn't like me physically and then you didn't like me emotionally. You didn't like my personality. So he didn't like directly say it, but it felt like he conceded and he was kind of like, fair enough. Yeah, I don't know if there was enough there to keep dating after. And I, I like to finally see him like concede, like, okay, maybe dating afterwards wasn't gonna happen. Like he keeps claiming that, but it is it is clear he didn't like her enough. But both of them remain calm during this conversation. Zenob was being very like childish at first when he came in and she was like, oh, I need another drink. I need to uh, like avoid him. And he behaved a lot more maturely, like trying to have the conversation. So I think his approach helped both of them stay calm and stay drama free, which I'm sure the producers didn't want, but it, it's good to see them like be normal and friendly with each other and not like 
wild because Zeynep especially gets very wild on social media and since then she's still I think taking digs at him on social media which I do think it's just like to create engagement for her socials and it's her claim to fame it's her five minutes and she's just like rolling with it but at the same time it makes her look very like she can't move on from something that she was the one saying no to she was the one who said no at the altar first in conclusion Cole wants someone smart, funny, and that looks good in a bikini. <laughs> Again, in conclusion for Zainab, she just keeps saying her DMs are open, as in for a man in her life, but I feel like saying that over and over is just gonna invite more and more haters into your DMs, because I bet her DMs are not open. I bet they're really vicious and scary and like I would not want to go in there <laughs> if I was her. So next let's talk about Colleen and Matt. Their arc was all about their marriage, how marriage is going. They keep saying they're happy but they don't live together. They still haven't moved in together a year later and everyone around them is concerned about that but they keep being very defensive about it and also they bicker about a lot of things. Ugh, this couple like makes me very uncomfortable. I've talked about it a lot already. It's a lot of the same with this couple. Sometimes she feels like she's a hostage. <laughs> At first we see them, they're arguing about getting his dog neutered. Apparently he doesn't want to get it neutered. He's against that and she really wants him to because the dog is humping everything and humping her, I think. I don't know why Matt is so against it. Like, is it because he's a Republican, allegedly? It does look like a very purebred dog, so maybe he has hopes of like breeding it and making money off that, I don't know. Also like, they totally want different things. It seems like he wants to live in Fort Worth and she wants to live in Dallas. As someone from Texas, this is not a conversation worth arguing about. <laughs> Both Dallas and Fort Worth suck. <laughs> Sorry, that's shady, that's shady. Colleen and Matt keep saying they've grown and had a lot of growth in their relationship, but still seem a little toxic. At least she keeps making fun of his short legs and he's not super offended by it. He's taking the teasing well. At least she has something. At the girls hangout is where Colleen says, for the first six months, it was really rough with them. And I'm like, six months, that's like, uh, most of the time, at least half of the time you've been together. They kept butting heads and she says they don't live together because of the dog not being neutered. It feels like a cover-up excuse to like a deeper issue. I think the deeper issue is they want to stay married as long as the contract from Netflix allows and then get divorced, but that's just the theory. <laughs> when we see the boys hang out, Matt is also defending that they don't live together there and being very defensive about it. He's like, I would have to pay $5,000 to break my lease. And Brennan was like, <clears throat> I broke my lease <laughs> for my marriage. <laughs> it's clear they see through the excuses and figure there's some deeper thing why they don't live together. At Alexa's birthday party, Colleen and Matt are very bickery with each other to the point that Raven notices and says their vibe is very weird. I'm glad finally someone said it. I feel like no one in the cast had mentioned it outright that Colleen and Matt are weird. And leave it to Raven, who's my favorite on this cast, I'll just say it, to be upfront and be like, their vibe is just strange. <laughs> because I imagine seeing it in person is just as weird as how we're seeing it. Also, there's one point at the party, Matt mentions having kids and Colleen is like, makes a total ick face about it. I feel like she's mentioned wanting kids before and I wonder if the ick face is more about having like Matt's kids. She's like, no kids yet. I want a dog first. A floof. Uh, millennials. This is a side note, but I am obsessed with Colleen's confessional outfit around the party time. It's like this Y2K like feather top and I was like, okay, work. So later on we see Colleen and Matt have lunch with his family and they bring up being concerned about them not living together. Again, Colleen and Matt are defensive about it. Matt says that his love language is being annoying. <laughs> oh my God, this poor girl. <laughs> She's a hostage and you can tell like she's actually annoyed. It's not like funny annoyed. It's like she's upset. There's one point in like a couple confessional, the producers ask them like, what are your pet peeves about each other? And Colleen is like that he is so annoying and that he annoys her on purpose. He says something along the lines of, we're always laughing, which is key. <laughs> Cut to uncomfortable laughter from Colleen being annoyed. And he says the best thing about her is that she always wants me to be happy. Matt, 
Name one quality of Colleen that does not involve you. Quickly. What is her favorite color? What is her favorite musical artist? What does she do at her job? Anything. Just from what we've seen. Just from the edit. I don't know how he is in real life. But the, he seems like the type of guy to not know anything about his wife. And then his wife knows every little detail and particular thing he likes and dislikes. They also discuss buying a home, which is kind of their conclusion that they're ready to buy a home together. But again, they want totally different things. She wants Dallas, he wants Fort Worth, she wants an old home, he wants a new home. Like, no compatibility. It's crystal clear. And Colleen asks Matt the age-old question, would you still love me if I was a worm? And he says no. Not surprisingly. This couple's divorce announcement is imminent. I can just feel it. I still can't believe they're married. They seem like people that just started dating and are figuring out they're not compatible at all. I mean, I guess that is kind of what they're doing because they were basically strangers on Love is Blind and it moves so fast. Moving on to Alexa and Brennan, uh, their arc is that they're happily in love. They seem ready for kids. That's kind of their end point. And also they hate Cole collectively. They're the couple we open the three episodes with and we see Alexis' rich family, her dad always looking like he's about to ask if a banana costs $10. And the dad is kind of mean to Brennan. It's made to be lighthearted, but he kind of teases him a lot. Oh, this conversation was interesting. Alexa really wants to have a C-section and I knew she was gonna be criticized for this. She did approach the subject in a very ignorant way because she's saying she wants C-section because she doesn't want anything stretching out her vagina. And she's talking about that with her stepmom who has had kids before. I might have an unpopular opinion here, but every option for childbirth is really difficult and painful. And I just don't judge anyone for wanting any kind of thing to make it more comfortable for them. Even though she could have said it better, and I saw a lot of criticism on the subreddit about this. And some people were understanding and like, I understand her choice and I respect it, but she could have said it better. She really made the choice seem very like simple and like, oh, I'll just get a c-section, it's easy when a c-section might be easier just in the moment of giving birth but the recovery is much worse every option honestly really sucks <laughs> every option vaginal or c-section or abortion whatever it is the person chooses it is difficult and painful <laughs> so you go girl for wanting to have kids i love that for you as she says it nobody should be judged for what they choose to do with their own body. So yeah, she's great with Brennan, not much on the marriage front, they're just ready to have kids. Her birthday party thing though, th I wanted to talk about this here because it was her party. They also did a birthday party for season two of After the Altar. And I wish they would just keep it like season one where it was more like a formal love is blind celebration event. It just felt more genuine. The birthday party thing feels very fake because a person having a birthday party is gonna invite their core friend group, not fellow cast members. Some of them they don't even like. Some of them they hate, like Cole. This is the fun fact that proved it for me that the birthday party thing is just a cover for getting everyone to show up in formal wear. Alexa's birthday is September 28th. Uh, this is filmed in August 2022. Like, we are two full zodiac signs away from <laughs> her actual birthday, and they're having this birthday party. I did think it was a good choice to have Alexa be the one having the birthday party because a socialite type of person like her would have like a lavish formal party. And yeah, Alexa and Brennan, their other plot points, like, they really hate Cole with a passion. Alexa mentions she hired entertainment for the party and it's Cole as the clown, which is a very mean-spirited comment, but like, I thought it was a little funny. Hey, on me all you want. And in conclusion, Brennan gives Alexa a little baby outfit symbolizing that they're ready for kids. They seem happily married. They seem like they are not gonna have a divorce announcement soon, but you never know with these couples, to be honest. And finally, we have Raven and SK, and their plot was really sad because it became irrelevant once news came out of SK completely cheating on Raven. Their arc was that Raven and SK said no at the altar, but they have been dating ever since. They got an apartment together. In these episodes, he's working towards a proposal. Again, very staged, very much something producers would love. Honestly, if this story had worked out, this is like a producer's dream 
for after the altar it would have been a great ending because it ended with sk proposing the biggest ring i've ever seen but he's a cheater so it was all for nothing <laughs> At the beginning, she's very into him. I mean, there's a very staged, like, picking up at the airport scene. No one else getting off the plane. I thought it was funny how she was like, I don't know how he has time to do work and school and FaceTime me all the time. And also cheat on me with multiple women. <laughs> like, she didn't say that part, but like, how does he have the time for all that? She has also changed her mind on something she was very solid on before. She didn't want to move out of Dallas before and now she's open to the idea which shows like growth for her and also shows that she is compromising which was a big issue for her before with SK but she hates a lot of places she she's very picky about where and I mean I thought it was clear the only place left she hadn't mentioned was California and I feel like she had fit right in in California and I assume that's the only place she's willing to move. It was so hard this whole time to take SK seriously because he is so like talking up how much he loves Raven, how much he's ready to settle down with her, marry her and that like she's his girl. All these things where it's like oh my god like how can you be that fake and like secretly be completely cheating, caught red-handed in 4K on TikTok. It's kind of really scary how fake he is being. And that just goes to show y'all and it should teach y'all the lesson that like any of these people on this TV show could be like SK and living completely different lives. That's why I always say we are judging this edited and self-produced version of themselves. And we have no idea how they are. And some of the villains might be really nice in real life too. Like it's not just the nice ones are bad behind closed doors. We all believed in SK and thought he was a good guy and now we are all the fools. This whole time it's leading up to a proposal between SK and Raven. We don't see much of them at the birthday party. I'm really sad because I really thought her and SK were a PR relationship that they just wanted to like kind of milk the influencer opportunities that came with being like a famous couple on social media but we see the proposal on the rooftop and it's very moving and she says yes and that is the finale of this after the altar and then we see text that says a few months later the engagement ended and we see a raw kind of selfie video from Raven talking about the updates. So we get canon confirmation that SK cheated uh, from Raven herself like she's she says it out loud. First of all, it felt very real because it was like selfie cam style and it wasn't all this production to it because it was clearly made way after the fact. And Raven seemed genuinely really sad about it. And sure, maybe she could be sad that SK messed up their plan, even if it was more of a business move that they were together. But like, she was just saying she was really sad about what happened. Her life is totally different now and she didn't know at all. She was in love with the SK that we knew and we had seen on the show. And I felt really sad for Raven. Whether SK messed up as her fiance or as her just influencer business partner, it seems like it hurt a lot. I was very convinced they were very, they were kind of a fake PR couple and this update made me question it at least a little more. I will say I liked how real that update felt and I wish Love is Blind leaned into those moments more. So all in all, I think they did improve the format of After the Altar by shortening it, keeping clear arcs for everybody and cutting out some of the filler. We also didn't see any new partners and that's probably for the best because I feel like last season it got way out of hand when they showed Sal's new partner and the amount of hate she got online was just excessive for what went down. So let me know what you thought of Love is Blind 3 after the altar. I would love to hear about it in the comments below. Keep it civil. We're, we don't know these people. We don't know who they are behind these personas they put on so it's not that big a deal it's just reality tv and it is what it is i'm excited for future seasons of love is blind i'm ready for a new cast i hope y'all have a great valentine's day hope you have fun and enjoy the season if you celebrate it also are we watching perfect match 
Should I cover it? Let me know in the comments below that too. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed. I put out new videos once or twice a week about TV, pop culture, internet trends, and other miscellaneous things. And you can follow me at miscellaneous on Instagram or Twitter to find out about new videos or just turn on the bell notification here on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye!